وتحيته وسلم واحد دعوانا وللحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد واصحابه وبارك وسلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي We unfortunately did not record uh last week's session so what I will do tonight I will quick, quickly go through the slides of last week so that it is on record for the future and for people who may want to watch it afterwards so inshallah bear with me if we've been through it <clears throat> last week but i will then immediately start um with the attribute of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala al kalam um why is it not sharing um Okay, let me just uh, just bear with me for a second. Um Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin Allahu akbar Um so we on the 13th attribute al kalam we'll speak more about it but it basically is the attribute of Allah's ability or Allah's quality or Allah's attribute of speech What we did do uh previously was to discuss the question of what is speech and part of the reason uh without going into the detail we know what the normal purpose of speech is without having to go through all the reasons of why we speak uh but it is essentially a formal means of communication uh in a verbal form um but we've said that one needs not use words to communicate only um it doesn't have to be a spoken word and an example of that is um how we use sign language and also how animals communicate without actually using words but they communicate very effectively with one another now the key reason of why we are going into what is speech and how it happens within a human being is for two reasons essentially when we understand really what this quality is that we have been blessed with as human beings subhanallah it is a truly great ability and it should act as one of the awesome signs of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the creator of that ability within us to see how it operates but even if we look at how it operates within our own human bodies then you will see that there are limitations there are certain things that must be present and certain parts that must uh work together with one another and when we look at that we will see that and discuss further what is the difference between um human speech as great and awesome as it is but also understanding the limitations of human speech and then comparing it with divine speech and see whether that applies or not then we went on um to discuss very briefly what is human speech and we said essentially that speech is the result of a number of parts in our body working together it's not the mouth and the tongue um it's in fact a very complex process an extremely complex process 
and very delicate process. It is when um, air comes up from the lungs, pushed through up with the help of the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a, a muscle at the bottom um, of the lungs. Um, and when that contracts or expands, then it pushes up air into the lungs. And when that happens, the air moves up through the throat. And when it gets to uh, the point where, that we call the Adam's apple, now just behind that is the larynx or the vo voice box. Amazingly, when the air goes past the larynx, um, sorry, the larynx here, then it causes that to vibrate. Now, from previous examples, we've heard that sound is created by the movement of air. We can't hear things if the air does not move the eardrums, and that in turn gives us the hearing. So that which we hear, uh, a voice that we hear, is caused by a process that makes the larynx vibrate. And then it is shaped further by the tongue, the lips, um, and the mouth. And then what comes out of the lips are these tiny movements in the air, things we can't see. But the ears are so sensitive, subhanAllah. Everything about the human body is a miracle. Actually picks up these small vibrations. Now the, the, the amazing thing about understanding what a, a, a voice is or what a word is, is if you think it's only the tongue, if you, where you wherever you are sitting, now, if you don't let the tongue move the air that's coming from uh, uh, the lungs, the movement that's, that pushes up the air, and that that air is moved, and you, and, and you don't, for that moment, push up the air to utter a word. Because uttering a word means air must flow up there. Just move your tongue from side to side while bottom to top or anything, no sound will come out. Try it as you sit there. You will see no, no sound will come out. So it is a combination of the tongue working together with the rest of the body. And it is in fact forms the actual words. The tongue only is one of the things that assists in forming the words. Now, if you look at that, subhanallah, 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 it's an absolutely marvelous, fantastic ability that we've been given as human beings. So when we look at or we hear voices or people speaking, don't just listen to what is being said. Think of the creator of the ability to, 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 for us to speak, subhanallah. And in that way, you start recognizing Allah everywhere. Whatever you do, whatever you see, you will recognize Allah signs. And speaking, words, voices, conversations should all be reminders. Never mind the content. Never mind the content. The content is a separate thing. But look at the ability and what Allah has really created in human beings. Subhanallah. Now, when we look at speech, we should recognize Allah's greatness when we start understanding how complex and how marvelous and sensitive, yet very, very, very effective this particular uh, uh, ability is, subhanAllah. Now we look at, we have a snapshot of what is um, human speech. Let's look at divine speech. We said Allah's speech is not words. It's not sounds. It's not letters. Allah's speech is 
other than words, sounds, or letters. So if you think of Allah's speech in any way that you want to think, you're going to say to yourself, is it this? It's definitely not a sound. It's not a word. And it's not a letter. You'll come to, yeah, but what about the Quran, the letters? We'll come to that later. So knowing how our own speech works, it's a combination of many parts working together. But Allah does not have or require any body parts. Because what is the key word in this require? There is never a requirement on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ever under any circumstances. Never. Allah never needs. So if it was that before Allah could speak, Allah had to have a tongue or some body part that we can't describe or know of, it would mean that Allah is dependent on that particular body part to be present for Allah to be able to speak. And that can clearly not be uh, true. Because Allah never needs, Allah is never in need of anything. Subhanallah. The other thing which will be recurring all the time and has recurred um, is that Allah is not dependent on time. So Allah's speech does not happen when something else happens. You're going to quote examples or in your mind you're already thinking uh, about Nabi, Allah spoke to Nabi Musa. Now how does that work? Uh, time was involved because Nabi, Nabi Musa uh, lived in a certain period of the history of, of, of creation. We'll come to that later. But like all other sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah never relies on the passing of time to then do something or, or, or speak in this instance. Allah's speech is without beginning and without end and it is never dependent on any process or condition within creation. Subhanallah. You probably might want to ask a question about uh, how do we understand uh, be, without beginning and without end? Uh, when we say Allah's, Allah's speech is without beginning and without end, but yet Allah speaks. Uh, you, you can ask that question if you want to later on. The one thing that is very clear that Allah's speech cannot be tampered with at any point or any time. Allah's word is utterly unique and it's protected by Allah himself. Allah says so in the Quran. Falsehood, in other words, people who want to change the content of the Quran, um, they cannot do it because Allah protects it and it will be preserved in that form that it was revealed until eternity. The actual content will be preserved until eternity. But then Allah says, if any of the polytheists seek your protection, then grant him protection so that may, they may hear the words of Allah. Here, Allah speaks about Allah's words. Now, what is it that is being referred to? In this instance, it is what Allah revealed in the Quran. Those are by Allah himself refers to uh, the content of the Qur'an as the words of Allah himself. But the content of the Qur'an does not mean that that is the entirety of Allah's speech. It's, it's not even a drop within the ocean of Allah's speech, how Allah speaks and, 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 and what Allah speaks and, and all the things that link to, to speaking. But does it mean that it's only the content of the Quran 
that's the only way that Allah speaks. Allah can speak through revelation or inspiration. Allah can put hidayah directly in the hearts and inspiration into the hearts. Not necessarily through malaika, but directly. Allah can put that hidayah and inspiration and revelation and give you access to information uh, that doesn't necessarily have to come via the Quran. So the Quran is only a fraction and a glimpse of what is referred to as the word of Allah. It's not the totality of Allah's word. And Allah says in the Quran, it is certainly we who have revealed the reminder, the reminder being the Quran, and it's certainly we who will preserve it. So there Allah confirms. Do what you want to do, but Allah is the owner and controller of the entire world. We and people can try and do whatever they want to do about the Quran, but the Quran will be preserved. And it's the only, only to date, the only revealed book that is totally unchanged because Allah has given us the assurance that Allah will preserve it. <clears throat> and it's truly a miracle how one portion of it that we are given access to is that through the Khufar, the content of the Quran have been memorized and the only book that even children can memorize uh, by millions of people since it was revealed. And it will continue uh, until Kiyama. Yeah, a miracle, there I give a definition of a miracle. And part of the reason is that Allah has made the Quran different to any other book, even the Qufad. As great as they are to remember things, uh, uh, to remember the Quran, you give them anything other way, book, and ask them whether they can memorize that book, they won't find it as easy to memorize, if at all. Even if it is a thin book with a fraction of the pages, they won't be able to do the same thing. There might be people sitting here um, who are Khufar who tell you from their own experience that <laughs> yes, the Quran is a true miracle in itself because Allah made it easier to remember than anything else. So its protection will be in the hearts of those who have memorized the Quran. But the po important point that we made uh, last week is the physical book itself cannot re be referred to as the word of Allah. Yes, generally we say this is Allah's word, protect it, uh, respect it, place it in a place of respect and, 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 uh, and so on. And you have to have wudu when you touch it. But the physical book, it is the content that is the actual word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, the, the unchangeable divine message contained in the book itself, that is the word of Allah. So the people who try to burn the Quran and destroy it and so on, they've not been uh, successful <laughs> in any way because the Quran has been preserved in the hearts of people and Allah is the one that ensured that it will be protected. Then we also made the point about how Allah sp spoke to Nabi Musa and what we said, and here the point comes, Allah says, Musa came at our appointed time and his Lord spoke to him. Two things comes out here. The one is the one point that relates to time and the other point rel relates to the fact that Allah actually spoke. So it's referred to as speech, as speaking. But here comes the question. 
Yes, it's a communication from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if Allah's speech is not a voice, and then physical ears cannot hear it. Because physical ears of human beings operate on the basis of the way sound operates. It's the movement of the air. The changes in the air makes the changes in the, 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 on the eardrum and that changes is con are converted to small electrical impulses which gives us hearing. Now, if Allah spoke to Nabi Musa and it's confirmed, Allah confirmed himself that he spoke to Nabi Musa, then clearly, if the physical ears cannot hear that which is normal sound, then it had to be that Nabi Musa was spoken to um, where he used his spiritual ears or his heart to hear what Allah was communicating with him. And we mentioned the point, inspiration and revelation are examples of how Allah can, can, can communicate with, with us. Allah speaks because the opposite of speaking is to be mute, inability to speak, and Allah has the ability to speak. Allah has confirmed that through that above verse. <clears throat> we must just, whenever we think of the question of this attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah speaking, never expect it to be the same as human hearing. In any way whatsoever, either the way it's spoken or the way it is received. I hope that is something that is absolutely clear. That never think that you will hear a voice like a normal uh, sound being transmitted which we pick up with your ear and then think that that is Allah speaking to you. It is totally and utterly unknowable. No one can know how Allah speaks. It's utterly and totally impossible for anyone to comprehend how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks. Only Allah knows how he speaks. No one else is able to. Is it then correct to refer to the Quran as... Um, as uh, the speech of Allah? What would be the answer to that? Both yes and no. The content of the Quran is the speech of Allah, but the actual physical book cannot be said to be. That is Allah's speech. So when you touch the Quran and touching Allah's speech, the content which is contained, I hope that point is clear. There's been lots of debate and discussion. Is the Quran... Allah speech, is it not, and so on. But nothing that is physical can be associated with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it has shape in its form and it had a beginning and at the end. Does it mean that if you touch the Quran and now you destroy it, there is no more Quran, you've actually destroyed Allah's speech. You can do nothing to Allah's speech. It's not something that is known or understood or comprehensible by us as you know. Um, let me just see. Auntie Salekha, your, uh, your, your camera is on. I hope you know your camera is on. <laughs> um, okay. So we're going to come to really a, continu a continuation of um, where we left off last week, we left off on, on, on the slide and now we're coming uh, to the spot. Imam Ghazali speaks, we're talking about speech, so the tongue is linked to the speech. So concern, Imam Ghazali speaks about the tongue, meaning not that thing that's between your teeth and in your mouth. He's speaking about speech, human speech. May Allah be pleased with him. The tongue is potentially the most dangerous limb of the body, he says, and extra care should be taken to safeguard it. We, we, we will speak more about 
why it is said to be dangerous. And he gives uh, advice as to what we should do to protect the tongue. Some of it we've touched on when we dealt with the ear, uh, but he said we should not get involved with nonsensical, aimless, purposeless, loose talks and discussions, things that lead nowhere. Uh, don't get involved in that. People are talking, I was going to say nonsense, but yes, nonsense and other uh, aimless, there's no purpose to what they're saying uh, and they want to draw you into that discussion. Just either don't participate or get out of that uh, environment. Because whatever the tongue gets involved with, good or bad, affects the body. In the same way that food that you consume will affect, affect the body either in a beneficial or a de detrimental way. And it makes us aware that by spending your time and in getting involved in aimless discussions where there's absolutely no benefit it might not be bad things that they are saying. They're just talking um, aimless, nonsensical stuff. Stay away from that because your time is going to be wasted and time should never be wasted. Time is one of the commodities um, that your whole life is based on. Without time, you don't have life. Every single second that passes, your life is shorter. Uh, that sounds like a, a throwaway statement. But your, your whole life is made up of all the seconds. So all the seconds that you waste, even if you're saying, oh, I can't wait for this and that, and you can't wait the time to pass, you're actually asking that your time of your life be shortened by so many seconds or that time that you want to pass quickly. So don't waste your time. Use your time. Uh, and, and not for idle and useless talk. This we've said a lot about. I'm not going to uh, repeat what was said, except to say, when you slander and backbite, that wrong that you did, you owe somebody, you owe somebody, you in debt, and you will transfer of your own good deeds or take on, take on some of their bad deeds as a way of compensating for what you've done to them uh, in the dunya. Um, of course, it's more well known that swearing and cursing, um, all of those things, what it does, it's not just haram to use uh, your, your, your tongue like that but you actually increase the amount of darkness around your heart. The veils, you remember the previous thing we did, the heart is surrounded by black and uh, nur, veils of nur of darkness and light. When you get involved in swearing, cursing, and doing all the other things, slander and so on, the amount of veils of darkness just start increasing. And what happens? The spiritual light of the heart uh, gets less and less and less and less till the whole heart just becomes completely black. May Allah protect us all. And Imam Ghazali radiallahu an, rahmatullahi alayhi, um, he says, a moment you get involved in any of the top things that we mentioned here, careless use of the tongue just a moment not continuous every day and you are that kind of person you do it. a moment's careless use of the tongue can strike off 70 70 years of normal worship what why is the why is it used as 70 years because 70 years as is considered as a lifetime. It's just another word for, for a lifetime's worth of worship. So we should be careful. We should be careful. 
this is not just something we should take lightly. It's not something where, oh, it's another hadith, it's another piece of nasiha or whatever. Your whole life of all the so-called good things that you've done can be lost by just using your tongue carelessly. So please treat this as the kind of advice that you will follow because it will assist you later on. <laughs> and if you've not done it, make Toba. Now there are certain sins, unintended and unknown even to you because you've not done it consciously but you are actually from what you are saying and, 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 and what you've said and how you said it and all of those things you could be committing a sin and this is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says a person may utter word he thinks is harmless which results in his falling the depth of 70 years into hellfire is this the same hadith? It's also 70 years. It doesn't refer to him spending 70 years in the hellfire. It says falling the depth of. Subhanallah. It gives us an idea that when you talk about Jahannam, it's in some places referred to as a bottomless pit of fire. And the deeper you go, the more intense uh, the fire is. Falling for 70 years, deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into Jahannam. That is what this hadith speaks about. And it could be a harmless, the person might think, I'm just making a joke. I just said something harmless. Uh, the other people were laughing uh, and he thought it was a joke. But that one thing, so-called harmless thing, could result in that person falling for 70 years deeper and deeper and deeper into the darkest, most fiercest uh, 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 pits of Jahannam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us because here Rasulullah speaks about the person who thinks he utters something harmless. And how many of us already did it, are doing it, and still will be doing it. So just be careful. Take this, this advice as very, very serious advice. Now comes something unknown, unintended. People who are constantly talking they can't stop. They are referred to as talkaholics uh, in some literature. They are always talking non-stop. They are so engrossed in this habit of constantly talking that they don't realize how that is affecting the people around them. They don't realize. Now it's not only, yes it is, but it's not only that none, when that person is in the company, no one else is given a chance to speak. Yes, often that is uh, one of the prime outcomes of being in the company of such a person. No one else has a chance to speak. That person dominates in discussion. Uh, and has something to say about everything and everyone uh, and continuously. That's at the basic level. That's almost, uh, yeah, we never get the chance to speak when that person is around. That we kind of understand. But medically, they have now found, they've discovered that being in the company or exposed to a person who has this problem of talking not only excessively, but continuously um, has an extremely negative impact on the mental health of those who are exposed to it. 
So if we suffer from problems like that, I was like one of, I was one of these people. I had something to say about everything. I had an opinion about everything. I hope I'm better now and only the people around me will be able to judge how I have managed to, to, to work on this or not. But it's actually two, two points medically. The one is you have a very adverse, detrimental social and health impact on the people around you without you realizing it. Because what you are talking about are, could even be good things in your opinion. It could be advice that you're giving. It could be sharing the story. Did you hear that or whatever? But it's harmless. Uh, uh, uh. It could even be potentially, potentially beneficial. But you don't understand what it's causing to other people, especially if they constantly exposed to it and has now been proven medically that it has a very very negative mental and social impact on on, on people's well-being now listen what rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said when <coughs> mu'ad um was leading the prayer um, and some of the companions were so upset that every time he led the prayer he used to recite long, long, long surahs to the point that they had to shorten their prayer because they had other commitments that they had to attend to. They could not spend so much time. And they went to complain to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Mu'ad is reciting this very, very long surahs every time. And then Rasulullah approached him. This is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. Oh Mu'ad, are you driving people away from religion? And another one, uh, another translation or version of the same hadith is, O oh, Mu'ad, are you causing fitna? Because the, the fitna comes from, uh, yes, they might not be breaking or shortening their salah, but their mind is elsewhere because what is being recited is too long and they could not concentrate on what is being said or recited. So how and what we say and how much we say can be extracted from this hadith. You are driving people away even if you are giving them good advice. A person who is constantly on people's place giving good advice, good advice, good advice uh, all the time, non-stop. People will switch off and say I'm not interested in what you are saying even if it's the truth. Even if it's good advice. So let us learn from that as one thing. And the second thing is on the path of the people who want to purify their heart. One of the Tasof Shuyuk, um, Sheikh, Sheikh Shabrawi. Um, he advised in the degrees of the soul in his book he said at the very basic level of this path of wanting to purify your heart that is what our purpose is uh, beloved brothers and sisters to purify our hearts. Whatever we do, it should be to purify our hearts so that we can be in touch with the haq and, 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 and get the, 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 the true light from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala falling on our hearts and influencing our behavior. So the purification of the heart is the essence of the spark 
of wanting to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he advises, and it's repeated in other ways, but I think the way he, he put it in his book captured it very succinctly and, and beautifully. He says, eat less, sleep less, and talk less. If you want a simple formula, practical, realizable, doable, you have to know nothing more. Just take this, what he has told us. Eat less, sleep less, and talk less. Focus only on that. Don't do anything else. For, 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 for a, until you have kind of mastered this. Maybe the one would be more difficult than the other, but now we're talking about, uh, about speaking. And I would say, it's not an easy one. Some people are, are paid to speak. <laughs> Our brother Muhammad Fasih as a radio announcer, uh, he can't speak less he has to speak when he has to speak. When I was uh, a member of parliament, I had, to, I had to speak. I was paid for that. We're not talking about that. We're talking about people who are involved in an informal or even formal arrangements with other people and continuously speaking nonstop. Whether it is good or whether it is bad, it has a negative impact. And it's been confirmed by uh, what Rasulullah sallallahu said to the companion, uh, uh, the Sahaba Mu'ad. I just want to take a quick break there before we go on to um, uh, the last one or two slides. Uh, I'm opening up the floor if there are any, um, any questions or comments that anyone wish to add at this stage. Uh, um, I just want to comment on that because I thought it was quite an interesting point. Um, Bidisali being someone who was in, in politics, and myself also find myself in a certain field. Uh, it's amazing how there is a responsibility that goes with words. Uh, and, 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 and I think that people generally, they look at, at uh, people who are auditors, who have platforms, and they say, oh, this person is very fortunate. And alhamdulillah, you are very fortunate to reach people if you can do good. But I think there's a huge responsibility that goes with it, that one has always got to watch your tongue and what you're saying. And if what you're saying is contributing to the good of society, if you have gotten that platform, or if it's contributing to, the, to, to, to a negative in society, because you, can, you carry the burden either way, in a sense. Uh, and, and I think that, uh, so, so uh, even more so with people who have a platform, the responsibility is even greater, subhanAllah. Yeah. Uh, because, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, gave a person a platform and therefore you'll be answerable for that platform more so than a person who doesn't have maybe doesn't have the same kind of voice but on the matter of speech in itself um there's one other thing and that is when a person relates to someone else and they are and they are um, engaging with someone else in the matter of Allah's kind of speech as the side is mentioned last week one thing that could come to mind also is that isn't, isn't our speech also, and our thoughts also part of what is this, what is defined as Allah's part of the speech? Because it all comes from Allah's part of the Okay, let me deal with the first part okay, of, of the comment that you are saying. Muhammad yeah. Fasir, uh, yes, your comments are very valid, uh, but I think we need to add a rider to, to, to the first part of your comment. Uh -huh certain people are uh, placed in positions, like teachers, for example. They can't go and teach if they don't speak. And they probably have to speak uh, from the moment they, uh, they enter the classroom till the end. We are talking about people who are placed in situations where they have the option 
They are not required to speak all the time. Yet, they are blocking others and that continuous uh, talking works on people's nerves. They get sick. They get affected by it. And the person who's doing it doesn't even realize that it's having that. That's the kind of uh, thing that we, we are warning people against. It has a negative impact on the other people. And sometimes the people who have that problem don't realize it, but they have a medical condition. People have had identified that as part of a medical disorder, uh, which I am not equipped to make further comment on. Um, the second part that I do want to say is nothing is part of Allah, nothing is part of Allah Sifat, nothing is part of anything. So we can never say it is part of um, uh, Allah's speech. Everything belongs to Allah. Allah is the creator of that. That is the link. But similarity, unlike Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning Allah, the divine essence, as well as all the attributes are unlike anything in creation. Always. There's never an exception um, as long as we make that distinction. Okay. <laughs> um, Let's, let, let's move on to the, 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 the last part of the, the presentation. Um, lying. Now, Lying, we all know lying is, is wrong. The thing to say about lying, whether it's big or small. You can say white lies are okay under certain circumstances and there's lots of hadith around that. If you're trying to protect life or, you know, property or things that you can lie. Have you got the key of the safe? Uh, maybe, I, I don't know. I don't want to go into that kind of detail. There are exceptional circumstances and Allah would be the judge. But generally lying, even as, there's no small lie or big lie. If you know you're consciously um, conveying a message which is untrue, uh, untruth, Oh, it's not a small thing that you said or whatever. Don't even get involved in the small things. The small things ultimately become big things. So lying is wrong. Let's just put a full stop there. Now often, lying, the bad part about lying um, is not only what we are familiar with, but there's a part of lying that is closely associated with arrogance and boastfulness. People want to, um, they lie about what they have and what they don't have. They want to give impressions of being important. I did this, I own that, I have this, and all of the other things that goes with lying in order to create an impression or to boast to others about that which is not true. And the Quran, obviously the context was different, but the Quran is written for all times. Allah speaks to the believers, why do you profess that which you do not practice? It is most loathsome in the sight of Allah that you profess what you do not practice. Yeah, it, it refers to a practice, but why do you profess that which you do not? Why do you press, profess to own what you do not own and you can put other uh, 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 deeper, different um, understandings of what Allah is saying to us as believers. Lying is wrong. Now, you, you either lie because you want to insult or ridicule or belittle somebody uh, in, in the presence of others or sometimes not even in the presence. Um, 
uh, you do it in the absence or you are doing it because you want to be seen as the special, beautiful or rich person. Um, or you are lying just to be a slanderer who creates animosity and ill will amongst people. Whatever category you're lying falls in, it's all sinful and there is no justification for it. We're not talking about the extreme exceptions. Um, that is something that Allah will judge. Then comes something that's close to lying, and that is giving false evidence. Don't be party to somebody calling you. Come tell what you saw here and there because you have to back up your friend, your sister or your brother who's saying something in an argument and expecting you to confirm what is not true. It's a form of lying where you are giving, no, I was there, I saw it, I was, pre stay away from situations that can lead to that. And within family situations, it's quite uh, common. The one brother calls the other brother uh, to say what he heard and what he said, or the one sister about the other sister. Let's try and advise people not to, uh, if they haven't done it, uh, if they haven't heard it themselves or directly affected by it, they should stay away from it. Even if what they are saying to give evidence that it's true, the one person is saying, uh, I saw that person doing that. You were there. Even if it's true, rather keep quiet. Try and get out of the situation. I can't remember. I, I don't want to get involved. I can't remember. Find a way of extricating, moving out of that awkward situation if you cornered where they're forcing you to confirm something that... Uh, 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 you the proof. You are going to give evidence again. You do that kind of thing. You're actually laying the basis for what will happen in the Akhira. Where every stone and mosquito and uh, carpet and chair and you name it will give evidence against you. So let us stay away from giving false evidence. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked, who is the most excellent amongst Muslims? And he said, one from whose tongue and hands other Muslims are secure. And as the representatives of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth, we should even extend it to where our tongues and our hands People are secure from that, whoever they are, Muslim or non-Muslim. Let us not be people where your, 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 your non-Muslim neighbor uh, is not sure about you. He must, he or she must have confidence. No. That person, whatever his name is, he's a Muslim. They don't lie. Uh, that's a Muslim person. No, they won't steal. It can't be him. It must be some other. People must develop that kind of confidence that people are secure from your tongue. In other words, what you say and what you do. Rasulullah sallallahu says, if we believe in Allah and the last day, of course we believe in Allah and we believe in the last day, as Muslims, as believers, you must speak good or remain silent. In other words, Allah is speaking to us and saying, you believe in Allah, take Allah's advice. The last day, you must believe in that because that is the day 
where after you are going to have to account for what you have said and done. So in order to safeguard yourself, rather not speak, unless you have to speak something that's good. And if you are speaking good, don't, 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 don't do it in a way where people's minds switch off, like in the case of the Sakaba. He's going on and on and on with a verse where it, people's minds are wandering and other people are breaking and shortening their salah. So speak good or remain silent. But try and do something that um,
Thank you. 